Okay. All right. Uh, now we're talking today with Jerry Benson of Spring Lake, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay. So, Jerry, begin at the beginning. Uh, where and when were you born? <laughs> Lafayette Township, Gratiot County. Uh, in what state? 828-26. Okay. That's in Michigan? Yeah, yeah. Michigan. Okay, Warren 26. Okay. Now, up in Gratiot County. All right. Now, did you grow up in that area? No, not really. In order to clarify some of the details, My mother married Ray Benson, and there were five of us, Harold, Reba, Earl, myself, and Arlene, but she was diagnosed with TB when I was going on too, mm -hmm. and she was pregnant with Arlene, and the family was all split up. Our father couldn't take care of us, so <clears throat> there for a couple of years, I don't know where I lived. Okay. Friends and relatives, mm -hmm. along with the brothers and sisters. <clears throat> and when I was going on four, I went to live with my grandmother on the mother's side of the family mm -hmm. and my two uncles. So that kind of clarifies where I grew up okay. and who I lived with. And was this on a farm or in a town or? Well, orig originally, <clears throat> uh, my grandmother, Harry and Luther, my uncles, lived in Flint. And they lost their home in 29 and moved back up to Ithaca and went to work on a dairy farm. <clears throat> and in 19, the spring of 1934, the shops began to work a little more, you know, maybe four or five months out of the year. So they moved back down by Mount Rose. <clears throat> And especially Harry always wanted a farm. He loved animals. And they rented 40 acres that was on the Flint River. And started <clears throat> a dairy herd. We had chickens and pigs and two or three cows and a team of horses. So basically, in 1934 is when we start living on a farm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and over the years, boy, the farms got bigger, and they was able to buy their own property <clears throat> just north of, of uh, Goes my mind. Okay. Mount Morris. All right. <clears throat> so, all through the Depression and the pre war, it was <laughs> farming because mm -hmm. they still worked in the shop. So, I had my work to do. <laughs> so you learned how to milk cows? Well, that's one thing that I really didn't do. Okay. My job was cleaning barns, feeding the chickens and the pigs right. and 
horses and okay. that kind of stuff. Now, do you remember um, how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, that particular day, it was very mild. And at lunchtime, <clears throat> Harry said, I think it'd be a good day to take care of the horses. I got the horses out, tied up in front of the barn, heated up some water, and we sponged and combed and trimmed and played with the horses. <laughs> and I don't know, it must have been around 4 o'clock or 4.30. Grandma, she come out the back door and hollered, it's on the radio. Japanese is bombing Pearl Harbor. Where's Pearl Harbor? <laughs> Life completely changed. Okay. That so, day on. So what changed for you? Well, of course, almost immediately, industry, all the shops, Chevrolet, AC spark plug, Buick, everyone, war production. Mm -hmm. Longer hours, and since they had quite a bit of seniority at Buick in Flint, a lot of the work fell to me. Mm -hmm. Consequently, I missed a lot of school, especially in the spring and in the fall harvest. Mm -hmm. Go to school, fall asleep. <laughs> but that was the condition of everyone. Okay. Well, were you able to keep up with school? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I graduated from high school. Okay. And when did you graduate? 44. All right. Uh, and then that was spring of 44. <clears throat> and then when I, was, when I was 17. But in that time period, <clears throat> the shops farmed out war production to whoever could manage. A neighbor across the street by the name of Harold Brophy <clears throat> was head of maintenance Patterson Building in Flint. AC spark plug come out, done some work on an old chicken coop, and set up four lathes, turn the machine gun barrels. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to school with his son, and that was very interesting. I'd or when I get my work done, especially on a Sunday afternoon. And he taught me to run a lathe, turning machine gun barrels. At the same time, Glenn Montague, a big farm down the road, turned one of his buildings into a machine shop. And there were probably millions of one and two men basement shops or garage shops that was able to manufacture war goods mm -hmm. during the war. And even in school, the shop class, they brought in big crates of model airplanes that was solid wood. Our job was to sand and glue everything together according to instruction <clears throat> and paint, put the details on. And when you finish so many, you were allowed to keep one for yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, my 
next older brother, and he joined the Navy, Navy Air Force. And he was home on leave, and he come to visit, and he saw this model hanging there. And he explained, after I told him where I got it, in the shop class, mm -hmm. and he said, <clears throat> they use those for identification. He said, they hang all kinds, <clears throat> different countries and different models and everything, various heights, turn off the lights, turn the fans on, take a pencil spotlight, pick out an airplane, have five, five seconds to identify it. <clears throat> and I can imagine the schools all over the country took part in that mm -hmm. operation. And even <clears throat> stores, there is a store in Saranac, and I think it was probably Lear where these people started a factory in Saranac wiring switches. Because <clears throat> Lear was into inst instruments, and even high school students could work so many hours a week in this place wiring switches. They closed the roller rink in Mount Morris, turned it into a machine shop, and years later, in 19. 67, and even before that, when I was working, <coughs> a vendor by the name of George Beamer has had a shop here in Perrysburg that I went to work for, and it turned out that he had the shop <laughs> in Mount Morris, mm -hmm. the turn. Okay. Roller ring. All right. Now, to go back to your story, now, when you finished high school, um, did you have the option of getting a deferment from the draft, working in the war industry or on the farm? No. No, when, when I was drafted, I went in the Army. I'll tell you, there was an attitude that covered the whole population that you would do most anything to serve the country. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I went into service. had my basic training in Camp Van in East Texas, Northeast Texas. All right. Now, when did you start training? In December. Of 44? Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Which was, they really concentrated the basic training at that time. But one incident, General Stillwell was in China. I don't know if he was relieved, but he was back in the States, inspection and whatnot. And they had a live fire obstacle, of course. <laughs> and he was grumbling and growling about the people that wasn't putting forth any effort, or much effort, and it just so happened that 
four on this one. Obstacle course was Stillwell. His nickname was Vinegar Joe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well named. And then when basic was over, I shipped overseas and landed in Lady, All right. in the Philippines. Now, okay. So how long did basic training last? I'm not sure whether it was about 12 weeks. Okay. 10, 10 12 weeks. All right. And uh, aside from the obstacle course, what else were they teaching you in, in basic training? <laughs> well, practically everything. You were trained in machine guns, mortars, rifle, a different kind of rifles, mm -hmm. machine guns, and and of course you artillery. They had artillery, mortars, and so on and so forth. It was very concentrated. Mm -hmm. And how did the drill sergeants treat you? Hmm? How did the sergeants treat you? As I remember, very good. Okay. But of course, if you fell down and lagged behind and on a 20, 25, 30 mile march, you got poked in the ribs and <laughs> said, come on, get up and move. It was very, very concentrated. You had um, sessions in, with gas mask and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. Now, uh, how did they get you from Michigan down to Texas and from Texas to the West Coast? Train. Okay. And do you remember anything about those train rides? Not much. <laughs> it, was, it was all very bottled. You take train cars packed with other fellows, and of course some of them are able to play cards. Or it was it was very concentrated. I don't have much memory of these okay. trips on a train. All right, but military trains had more or less the right of way. Okay. And I spent, I don't know, a few days on Angel Island, San Francisco, mm -hmm. loaded us on Liberty, landed in Hawaii for about 18 hours, and made a few circles in the Pacific, getting away from, staying away from submarines, and landed on Leyte. Okay. Now, when did you arrive in Leyte? I don't know. To tell you the truth, I okay. dates. Okay. But, but Timeline. The, all right. So the war, the war was still going on, though. Well, very low in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. There was some mop up, but it was basically. The actual big fighting was on Okinawa, mm -hmm. but the Japanese, there was just remnants of the Japanese army left in the various islands. Right. And shortly after we landed, <clears throat> just outside of Takloban, <clears throat> The work detail that we were pouring cement, making a floor for a building. And they set up a field kitchen on site. And two individuals right ahead of me in this waiting to get served food. One of the servers recognized this guy. He was Japanese in American clothing, mm -hmm. kind of hiding his face and whatnot. Well, that turned into a wrestling match for a few minutes. 
And at that time, the <clears throat> Philippine Army, which comprised a lot of uh, kids, teenagers, mm -hmm. reporting on movements of these remnants of the Japanese, which maybe was 25 or 30 in a group, or maybe bigger, raiding villages for mm -hmm. whatever food, whatever they could find. Okay. Now, at this point, what unit were you assigned to? Well, uh, on Lady, I was assigned to a temporary, which I don't know. Okay. Okay. So you didn't have a permanent assignment yet? No, I didn't have a permanent assignment. And I'd get reports of a raid, and, and of course with the Filipinos as guides and interpreters, and they would be armed. We'd try to run down these Japanese, which a couple times we'd run into live fire. But they didn't have much equipment. The Japanese didn't have much equipment because mm -hmm. there was no supply to them. Whatever they could steal or find. And I heard that they would even dig up where a battle had taken place to find ammunition or any kind of equipment. So there was just a couple times that I run into live fire on these patrols. But one very interesting time, <clears throat> and I don't know where it was, probably on Lady someplace, we met up with an Australian Ranger mechanized. They had a tank and a couple half tracks and other trucks. We mowed up on a road down by the ocean. <laughs> and we had time to wash our feet in the ocean, have our K rations. <clears throat> And they turned the radio on in the tank. And Tokyo Rose. They picked up Tokyo Rose. And she played a couple records. And then she'd go into her propaganda spiel, <laughs> which mostly was aimed at the troops in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And she even named off about three different officers by name and their units. But her main theme was uh, surrender now, you do not have a chance. If you want to see your family again, surrender. And then she'd play another record start in again, mostly the same theme. Mm -hmm. And I lay there on the beach. After all this was finished, I turned the radio off. Oh my goodness, you talk about peaceful. <laughs> Stars look like you'd reach up and touch them, moonlight on the ocean. Just paradise. <laughs> Shortly after that, I landed on Pan I permanent assignment mm -hmm. to 108th Infantry, six. Well, the 40th Division. 40th Division. Right. And assigned to headquarters section. And. <clears throat> The date, uh, you know, it was middle of spring. Okay. 
and <clears throat> we made one big patrol across the peninsula of Pan Lai. And every day, or the camp was set up in a coconut grove across the bay from Hilo City. And <clears throat> one day there was three of us up on a ridge above the camp. Heard some rustling down the ravine. And this woman come crawling up out of the brush and in perfect English she said, I will wash clothes for food. And her arms was all scarred and she had fresh cuts and whatnot. And we gave her band-aids and patched her up, stopped the bleeding. And she was so inquisitive, she won't know our names, where we lived, what kind of houses we lived, what the cities was like, what towns in the country. And she and her husband were school teachers in Manila. Mm -hmm. And he joined the Philippine Army when the Japanese invaded the Philippines. And she fled Manila. And hid out in the jungle, and I suppose villages. as part of the guerrilla group reporting Japanese and so on and so forth and wound up all through the war caring for orphans, children. And even at that time <clears throat> she still had four children. I think the youngest one probably four mm -hmm. up to maybe six or so. Well, we gave her, we gathered up some clothes and some K rations and away she went. Come back the next day. And of course, we contacted or put her in contact with our lieutenant mm -hmm. and this went on for a couple weeks <clears throat> and she just asked questions what was America like and, and just couldn't get enough of it mm -hmm. but she hadn't heard anything about her husband for a couple of years and of course, he, they made contact with the officials in town, Hilo City, and upper command, and whatnot. And she invited four of us to her camp. She said, Chicken dinner. <laughs> well, I'm not sure whether it was chicken or not. <laughs> But we had permission to go. Mm -hmm. And just a couple, three days after that, boy, they come to pick her up. And she gave me a, a picture that she carried all through the war. Let's see if I can get that so we can see it. Yeah, there she is. All right. And there was kind of a mutual feeling between her and I because there was an instant where some of the other fellows mm -hmm. started making rude remarks about sex for food and mm -hmm. this and that, that kind of crap. And 
I had another fellow defended her. <clears throat> and there was kind of a mutual feeling between her and I when she left big sister, little brother. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> she was, I suppose, maybe one of maybe hundreds or thousands of Filipinos that lived through that mm -hmm. and action and situation through the war. And <clears throat> she was just absolutely wonderful. And of course all this time why we were <clears throat> making practice landings and getting acquainted with the various ships and whatnot. <clears throat> and we knew what was coming. And it must have been the first part of June, I would say. Company inspection. Each company had an officer, group of officers. But in our company, after the inspection, this officer hollered, okay, you guys gather around. And of course, the uh, opening remarks, I, as near as I can remember, was congratulations and appraisal on past experience and accomplishments. And <clears throat> Then I quote, this division has received its orders. Invade Southern Honshu Island, Japan proper, but I can't tell you the date. He went on a little bit further. And <clears throat> He said, if you have a will and you wish to change it, do it right now. If you want to make a will, do it right now. He said, we have very strong reason to believe that every person you meet is your enemy. <clears throat> Whether it is an old man, a old woman, a younger woman, a little girl, a little boy, come at you with a pitchfork or a club, you know what to do. And then after a couple of remarks, he said, the casualty rate is estimated for this division to be 75 to 80 percent. Well, then we loaded. And of course, right after that, I dropped a bomb and theoretically the war was over. But to me and a lot of other people, the war didn't end until about December of 45. But on the way to, which turned out to be Korea, <coughs> we run into a typhoon. Now, I don't know exactly when that was. Maybe it was the first part of August, I'm not sure. 
or exactly how long it lasted. We were in that storm. But I immediately volunteered for KP. Because setting in the cargo deck of LST is not very inviting, or it wasn't to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this one night, well, things got rougher and rougher, and I got up and went up to the galley. No one was there. The waves was probably 25, 30 foot high. I got a sack of potatoes and five pound of raisins and a couple of life vests and wedged myself in a corner and rode the storm out. And one instance in that storm, as you can imagine, a ship rolling over, the whole side would be underwater, and then roll back. And there was a porthole up here. <clears throat> Rolled over, and on the way down, here was a bow of an LST. So close, I could see the individual rust spots around the bow doors. And I thought, oh my God, this is it. Went underwater. Roll back again, he disappeared. <clears throat> well, after all this was over, <laughs> I told an officer about it. Apparently, no one had seen this other LST except me, and I swear I was not dreaming mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was too real. <laughs> And we landed in the southern tip of Korea, Fusan. Okay. Now, I want to go back here a little bit. Um, the war, let's see, the, the bombs are dropped in early August of 45. So you had had your talk from the officer before that. And then you, and there, there were some big typhoons then in late August and September, and that's oh, that, prob that, probably it was, it probably was, what you were in. Okay, but uh, but okay, so you so you didn't stay too long uh, in the Philippines after the end of the war. No. Okay, so you go. Okay. No. So now you're going. Okay. So you land at Busan. Uh, now what happens? Well, when we landed in Korea. There was three of us, was assigned to an officer and his driver <coughs> at a jeep and a trailer. <coughs> Started up the east coast and what he was doing was meeting with Korean officials, taking over buildings for the troops, and it was mostly where the Japanese offices and airfields and everything. <coughs> <coughs> we made that trip up the East Coast and back down the center, and then we just got back to the company. And in the process of gathering up the Japanese, because they, apparently they wanted the officers for interrogation, mm -hmm. and a lot of it, I think, was I'm assuming was <clears throat> charges against humanity. Mm -hmm because most of the kamikaze pilots and flights originated, as far as I heard, was in Korea. You know, the <clears throat> dive bombing and crashing into ships. 
and what had happened in China and so on and so forth, and even uh, to the people in Korea. <clears throat> And they would conscript 14, 15 year olds into the army in Korea over the years. And I think I can find his picture. Oh, where did you go? Yeah, that's 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 one of them, but that's not the one that I was really looking for. Hmm. But anyway, this one particular individual with his uniform. Oh well, can't find it. That's no, okay. <clears throat> Was cleared <clears throat> and eventually uh, wound up as our mechanic and uh, engineers. <clears throat> But that was kind of a trying situation in that time length, rounding up these Japanese and taking them to an airfield. And I suppose the engineers had put up a fence and made this compound. Mm -hmm. And the company I was in was detailed as guard. <clears throat> and it was 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And this run through November and December. <clears throat> and we'd thrown up windbreak on the corners. <clears throat> And I just finished the patrol and stopped to get my hands warm. And some officers stepped around and accused three of us of sleeping on the garden up for court martial. <laughs> Does it make any difference what you said? Mm -hmm. You were guilty. Okay, break in rank. And they charged me a carton of cigarettes. And at the same time, due to discharging the old timers mm -hmm. from the time the war ended, it was still going on, and the company was down to about 52, 53 men. And the army put out this, what we called the Big Red Apple. <clears throat> Join the regular army, and if you are in the infantry, you will not be put back in the infantry, and you can choose your tour. Well, this court martial, uh, spending out in the uh, Coal for 12 hours at a time, and living in a shack. There was four of us in the company that joined the regular army. Mm -hmm. Come home on leave, report back to Fort Sheridan, which is just north of Chicago. Right. And we were there just a few days, and they loaded us up. And when the sun come up, we were going west. And I wound, 40, wound up 45 miles from where I started from in, <laughs> in Korea. Okay. 
thought was assigned to the 6th Combat Engineers. <laughs> when I reported in, this Major looked at me and said, What the hell am I going to do with you? I don't know. And he shuffled some papers on his desk. He said, have you ever handled dynamite and TNT? And I said, yes. You know what a bulldozer is? And I said, yes, I know. Okay, I need a demolition man and a dozer operator. And I wound up about 180, 85 miles south of Seoul about the same distance down to Pusan. Mm -hmm. And there was a fishing village <clears throat> about 14, 15 mile on the coast. This old Japanese airfield. Detached company. And I was put to work with another fellow at a rock quarry, <laughs> drilling holes and blasting, the, setting off the charge, and breaking up the big pieces and piling it up in a big pile. And the main project was building roads and Bridges get loaded up, go up on the mountain, widen the turns on the hairpin turns and up on the side of a mountain and this and that. And that was a start with the engineers and the lieutenant come up by one day took me up <clears throat> towards the coast, which was about four mile away, up into a big hill. <clears throat> and they'd already surveyed, had flags set up. And you start up here, clear everything off, because couldn't have brush and stumps and logs in the built four terraces down the side of the hill. There was enough room. <clears throat> twenty six or twenty seven houses or cabins. Mm -hmm. And that was for dependent housing, because they were moving a infantry regiment onto the airfield. Mm -hmm. And when I finished that, I and another fellow was introduced to a Korean contractor. They turned the, all the building process over to the Koreans. We were supposed to take this contractor to Seoul <clears throat> and he would gather building material. Well, we drop him off at a hotel and two of these fellows that I was in the Philippines with enlisted in the regular army was assigned to the 7th Recon Patrol in the 38th Parallel. Mm -hmm. So we stayed with the 7th Recon at night, pick up the contractor in the morning, and he'd come out of the bank with two big suitcases of money. And it was all practically all salvaged material doors and windows and paint and nails and 
boards of all kinds of stuff and <laughs> get a load, drive south, get unloaded, turn around and make another trip. Now, did you have a jeep or a truck or what? Truck, okay. six by. Okay. And <laughs> Of course, one mountain range in this trip. 24 hairpin turns to get across this mountain. Mm -hmm. At the bottom in the valley, there was quite a wide river. And a stake on each side, cement stake. You line up and aid for the stake on the other side. Road bed. Was in kind of rapids across the river. You had to ford the river. Well, high water made it a little difficult. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I don't know how many trips I made, but the last one was during a blizzard started when we were up to Seoul and south of Seoul there was a little town oh there's that picture I was looking for okay it's your Korean oh, soldier friend scripted yeah. into the army mm -hmm. This village was quite quite unique. The gates on each end of the village. Big structure with a tunnel through this building. And this was the winter of 46, 47, mm -hmm. and blizzard warnings. And of course, you always carried extra gas, you had 20 gallon of extra gas in five gallon cans. And at an MP post at this village and a fuel depot. I talked about another 30 gallon of gasoline. And we got 15 miles from this fishing village, probably 30 miles to camp, run out of gas. Uh, it was an MP post at this village. <coughs> And both of us, along with the Koreans that uh, was riding the truck, <coughs> severe frostbite. But they picked up the truck and we had a few days off during this blizzard and storm. And we bought, or the government bought, lumber from a monastery up in the mountains, which I have some pictures of this monastery and the buildings. I only made one trip to, to that place, but there are some interesting pictures. Beautiful place. Yeah, so you got your Buddha statue there. and. You know, kind of a pagoda style. But that was the big project, was building dependent housing. Or the Koreans did. Mm -hmm. We supplied the material and done the transportation. At the same time, they had a truck going to Fusan, about the same distance, all material there. Mm -hmm. And others 
into Central and whatnot. In the summer of 47, and towards fall, we'd go on red alert. Carry your arms. Well, these two fellows that was in the 7th Recon <clears throat> that we stayed with overnights. <clears throat> Every day it was getting more nasty, more fights, things was getting quite vicious. And <laughs> the last time I was up there, got first hand reports, the attitude, the North Koreans, and of course the same with American troops. <clears throat> I began to think, because I was really seriously considering making the military a career. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and through all that session, I thought, Oh, there's got to be a better life. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so it was kind of a touch and go there for a while, and, but I decided to give up the military. Now, uh, and I come home. Now let's talk and a little I bit more. My discharge. Okay. I told other people about, I wasn't sure exactly when, but be prepared because I think we're going into another war before long. Mm -hmm. And people laughed and said, no, nah. but it did happen. And I often wonder what happened to a lot of these people. And that we made friends with, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. All right. now, it was it was quite uh, quite interesting. Okay. Now, during the time when you were in Korea, there was also a fair amount of domestic unrest. They were. Did you see any of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It was. There was, there was a number of cases where it was quite violent all the way through from 45 to 47 and I really don't know what the cause was but when we were rounding up Japanese with the help of different Koreans And there was one instant that a Korean official, he must have been in quite a powerful condition mm -hmm. that we worked with, <laughs> he invited about eight of us to dinner. And of course we got instructions on how to act, what the greetings were formally mm -hmm. with Koreans and so on and so forth. And very long table, they sat there on cushions and there was a half a dozen girls serving. I really couldn't tell you what most of this food was. Mm -hmm. I know there was fish, cabbage, and who knows, mm -hmm. 
some of it was so sour that my gosh, you could smell it <laughs> six mm -hmm. foot away. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, sacking. I was doing pretty good on the soup until I run into a chunk of hide about that big square. <laughs> Still had the hair on it. <laughs> no, that was one one session with the Koreans. We worked with rounding up all these prisoners. <laughs> and yeah, there was some very interesting times. <laughs> okay. All right. Got this fellow here. He could speak very good English, and uh, I think he said when this picture was taken, he was probably 15. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, at this point, the tape is just about up, so we're going to pause right here, and I'm going to reload and rewind. Well, uh, we're just we're pretty close to being finished with my stories. Okay, uh, we have taken your story pretty much most of the way through the time in Korea. I have a couple of miscellaneous questions for you. Yeah. One of them actually goes back to the Philippines. Uh, I asked you before the interview, were you ever injured in the service? And yeah, you told just, me a story about that. Well, this particular time, I think it was on Leyte Island. Mm -hmm. When we were getting reports of Japanese raiding villages, they come under fire. I rolled off of a trail down a bank. <coughs> and that's where landed on this bush and splinters and <laughs> where they pulled so many pieces out of my back. Yeah, that was basically the only injury, but I was over there long enough that I got a touch of malaria. Okay. Now, had which, they, yeah. which eventually uh, wore out over the years. Now, had they given you medicine to prevent malaria? Oh, yeah. So you took Adabrin or something like yeah, that? Yeah, Adabrin. All right. Yeah, turn you yellow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it still yeah. didn't keep the malaria away in the end. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, water purification pills and whatnot. All right. In the infantry, it felt like a pack. Mule, mm -hmm. especially in the headquarters section where you had field phones, coils of telephone okay. wire. Yeah, when you were with the headquarters section, what was your job? What was your job with the headquarters? Well, it was uh, mainly <clears throat> runners of communication, okay. or in communication. In, in a combat situation, uh, one company would be supported by another. They had their method, of, and officers had to be in communication at all times. So in headquarters section, Many times your job was, was to take a message from your company or to an a company, company which might be from here across the street. Maybe a hundred yards or two hundred yards or whatnot. And that was just, that's basically what headquarters was in this group pictures right here and this fellow here 
was our interpreter and mm -hmm. guide. Okay. All right. And this was in the Fordit division. Right. Okay. Time period. Right. Now, uh, what what kind of relationship was there between the Americans and the Filipinos? I would say a good relationship. What little I personally right. had. This fellow right here, our guide and interpreter for our company, the Mrs. Headquarters mm -hmm. section. When we left the uh, Philippines board ship, he gave me this knife, an old family knife, there we wooden scabbard, mm -hmm. which was mainly built for cutting coconut off and coconuts and, and um, bananas. All right. Uh, a homemade wooden scabbard. So the relationship between this fellow right here and myself, mm -hmm. he presented me with this old family knife. Yeah. And it has a carved head on it. It's got a snake head or something. Or yeah, animal of some kind. I'm not. I'm not sure what that represents. Uh, Snake, dog, who knows? Uh, okay. Now, when you were in Korea, uh, and you were making that tour of Korea with the officer and going up and down, uh, what were you seeing? What did Korea? What did Korea look like to you? <laughs> well, we were. We would stay fairly isolated and outside of a town or. The city, but of course there was curious onlookers that would gather and look us over. We were mainly his guards are guarding his mm -hmm. equipment because mm -hmm. he would sign papers and whatnot, and he had a big storage box in the trailer that. He stored all these documents in, mm -hmm. but there was a couple occasions that uh, very close to a town that there would be a great number of Koreans would gather around and it was hard to tell. It was kind of a nervous <coughs> time yeah. for yeah. us because we really, really couldn't communicate mm -hmm. except wave your hand okay. or whatever. So, so you didn't have a Korean interpreter with you then? No. Oh. no. Okay. No, but this officer was uh, could speak Korean okay. and Japanese. Mm -hmm. And I think the driver, he acted as a driver and a guard, mm -hmm. bodyguard. So it, our instruction was to <clears throat> keep our eyes open mm -hmm. and only let people so close to the trailer. Right. So that time period, it was kind of a, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, really don't know what to, how to describe it. Okay. Now during the day, would you go into the towns and, or did you just stay outside of them the whole time? Well, in circle of town, sometimes drive through a smaller town, mm -hmm. but most of he, he would drive around instead of getting into a town because uh, of course the uh, Japanese 
attitude was very, very aggressive in all cases, and you never knew what you might run into mm -hmm. as retaliation or whatever in a, in a crowd. So it was a very cautious trip when it comes right down to it. Okay. Um, but the Japanese were basically cooperating though, right? I mean, they were staying well, in their barracks or doing whatever. Well, in, in Korea, outside of the officers, the enlisted men were mainly construction, mechanics, mm -hmm. Uh, fetch and carry. Yeah. The pilots at airfields and the officers uh, was was typically Japanese. Mm -hmm. As this picture of this young fellow who was conscripted into the army. He wound up as a sort of a mechanic, mm -hmm. and he said he hated every minute of it, but at least he got something to eat. As far as the, my impression of the Korean people were treated like treated like slaves mm -hmm. and dirty dogs. And even into this time period, This is typical. Okay. A woman Korean family. Carrying things on her head and the man with the two buckets on the yoke. Uh, yeah. So uh, they had they had very little <clears throat> as far as clothing, uh, commodities. That's very typical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I see you've got ox carts over here and yeah. mm -hmm. someone holding a pitchfork over there. Right. The Japanese, uh, <clears throat> my impression was that they took practically anything that was worth any value. Mm -hmm. uh, now, but was, of course some of the enlisted men had married because they, here again I don't know when the Japanese took over South Korea. They took over Korea back around the turn of the century, so yeah. they'd been there a while. Yeah, they'd been there for years. <clears throat> and there was a mix of families, Korean and Japanese, over the years, and that was one of the problems when we were sorting in 1945. Mm -hmm that so many of the men would try to escape and get back to their wives and families, mm -hmm. which <clears throat> to I and my fellow <coughs> in the company really didn't know our orders were to round up the Japanese mm -hmm. and hold them. And sometimes it turned into a situation that you may shoot above somebody's head or at their feet mm -hmm. <laughs> to control the situation. But, <clears throat> but most of the Korean people were 
situated or in a situation that they were very quiet and reserved. Mm -hmm. The common people like this mm -hmm. couple right here, right. which I have no idea who they were. Right. Uh, did there was a big rice paddy not too far from this airfield and <laughs> they were probably out gathering firewood and this and that and looking for food and mm -hmm. whatnot. Now, did you have problems with people stealing from you? From no, the camps really. or anything else? Not really. Of course it was <laughs> an MP post mm -hmm. on the on outside of the village, this fishing village, which controlled traffic on the road. And along the ocean it was very similar to areas along Lake Michigan, wooded high sand dunes and made travel by foot difficult and no we didn't well I suppose that there was occasionally kerosene gasoline and, and stuff like that that may have been wooden. okay but you well, didn't have a lot of trouble no no, we didn't, as far as I was concerned, or my experience, there wasn't any trouble with the Korean people. Mm -hmm. And when the government through contract work, like this dependent housing deal, mm -hmm. which was a big one for that particular area. The Korean people welcomed it. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very friendly. Okay. But of course, the American people and the servicemen, we were very generous. We'd hand out goods here and there, donate to the elders of this fishing village, pass out you know, odds and ends, old clothing, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was easy to make friends, okay. such as that one picture of that one Korean boy and this fellow that was conscripted into the mm -hmm. Japanese army and this monastery mm -hmm. these people were just super nice I think we're at the monastery this, yet the next page. Yes, there. Yeah. All right. Okay. So in your let's kind of go back now in your story. So when do you go home from Korea? Fall of '47. Okay. Uh, My enlistment run out. Right. And then did you go back home uh, to where you'd been living before the before you yeah. left? Yeah. Yeah. I went back to the farm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but we had a conversation. They had gotten along without me. And I had a went to work. I don't know a year after forty. Eight. Mm -hmm. I got a job in Chevrolet in Flint, and I don't know. My service days changed my attitude. 
I did uh, do quite a bit of work on the farm and, you know, planting and harvest time. Mm -hmm. But I was changed. I didn't want to be tied down night and day taking care of animals in the morning and taking care of them at night and so on and so forth. I was more <laughs> wanted to see the world. Okay. So in uh, 48, my older brother had a big farm over by St. John's of course, married and had a family, and I visited him. And he was mostly a uh, cash crop, mm -hmm. although he did have a big flock of chickens and sold eggs. <clears throat> But he offered me a partnership in his farm. So I left my grandmother and uncles and moved to St. John's. And at that time, my younger sister, or my brother left his insurance to our younger sister mm -hmm. and nephew. And I went to see my sister at Michigan State and met her roommate. <laughs> and there is such a thing as love at first sight. Mm -hmm. So I spent my spare time in East Lansing my sister got quite disgusted with me because she said, you never come to see me. <laughs> and I said, well, you're my sister. <laughs> so in the fall of uh, 49, I proposed and she accepted and we were married in January. 50. <laughs> now did you stay on the farm in St. John's or did you move on? No, when we got married, boy, we had an apartment, found an apartment in East Lansing, mm -hmm. in one room apartment in a private converted home mm -hmm. right across from campus. And she said, I'll quit. You go to school. I said, no, you're going to, not going to give up a scholarship. Mm -hmm. She had a four-year paid scholarship, and I got a job at Olds. Which was really quite fascinating to me, being in a big factory. Mm -hmm more experience than the three months I worked in Chevrolet and I kind of I took an interest in what was happening and got my job was on an assembly line front suspensions mm -hmm. and that was kind of fascinating and I asked questions and Oldsmobile had suggestion boxes and after a time I wrote a couple suggestions. Matter of fact, I think I wrote a half a dozen, was accepted a half a, mm -hmm. a couple times and I think that put me on notice of 
the foreman. And eventually I made repair man. But at that time, the union was really pushing for a hundred percent union. Mm -hmm. And I, we, we, Virginia and I, we'd talk things over and when she finished college, boy, at that time we really didn't know what we were going to do, but her father was recording engineer at United Sound in Detroit. And he'd worked in radio and sound systems practically all of his life. And then I will say 49 or maybe even 48, uh, they were developing magnetic tape. And being in the sound engineer, the recording studio, <clears throat> of course he was working on tape machines, tape duplicators, mm -hmm. to make a copy of a master tape. Mm -hmm. So long in that time period, boy, we kind of come to an agreement that when she finished college, I moved back to Saranac and her hometown, and I would do the mechanical work, and he'd do the electronic work. We built a tape duplicator, mm -hmm. and that kind of gelled the plan for us. But at the same time, working at Olds, I got into an argument with the union steward, and I said, look, I need every penny I can lay my hands on. I'm not going to be here. Only just a few short months now. And I got transferred into the inspection department. And when the time come, Within a couple of weeks of her graduation and our plan leaving Lansing, or East Lansing, <laughs> I gave notice and oh my gosh, foreman said, are you sure? And I said, yes. Well, two days before my last day scheduled, there were three, got called in the office, and three neckties. And they were interviewing me. Mm -hmm. School, service, various jobs, whatnot. And finally this guy said, General Motors is starting a program all quality control. We're taking individuals from various departments in all plants all over the country and forming this program that everyone is on the same page of how to do this and what to do and so on and so forth in inspection. And your name is on the list. Well, I'd already made commitment with my father-in-law, so I turned it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Who knows? <laughs> if I just stayed General Motors. All right. So did you then go into business with your father-in-law? Was that? Yeah. Yeah, we set up a shop in his basement in Saranac. I done the mechanical work. He done the electronic work. And, but of course, he couldn't compete with Ampax and big major companies that was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. But when the tape duplicator was finished and tested, he loaded it up and took it back to Detroit and put it to work. And that's when I started my career is in the tool and die business. Okay. All right. It got around town what we were doing. And I got a job at a local factory there in Saranac, a sprayer factory, making all types of sprayers, hand sprayers, and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> that was the beginning of my career in the tool dye business. Okay. And then machining. Did you eventually get a job over in West Michigan then? Hmm? Well, we're in Spring Lake now. Uh, how long have you been here? Well, we moved over here in 66. Okay. And I worked a couple, three different places in the 50s and 60s over in Saranac. Mm -hmm. I worked 13 years at Lake Odessa Machine. They had a tool room, repair, build dies, and a stamping plant, and <clears throat> I got to know George Beamer and other people, different plants that was doing work for us, that we'd have too much work especially with new dyes. And <clears throat> and when we moved over, I, I, well, actually, my last job in Ionia County was at Dow Smith, making fiberglass Corvette bodies. And my job in the engineer department was calling on vendors, writing reports, progress reports on jobs at Dow Smith Farm Dow. And I had a call up by Muskegon, North Muskegon, and come down the highway and see Falcon Tool over here facing the highway and I stopped to say hello and before I got out of there I was had a job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Now uh, there was one more story we left out that I want to go back to. Uh, your daughters mentioned that uh, when you were driving a bulldozer in Korea you almost <laughs> went off a cliff. <laughs> Well, a guy by the name of Joe Miller and I, we were the ones blasting rock. And they found another old rock quarry that they didn't have to transfer or transport rock from one to where they were building. Mm -hmm. So we loaded up the dozer and went over. And it was an old one. And I was up on top of this cliff, pushing the debris and dirt and brush over the edge. <laughs> and pushed over a load of dirt. And, and uh, when I 
they stopped. Those are wiggled around like this. <laughs> uh, look over on between this track and the body. And about that much of the track was hanging out over here off the cliff. And the right hand track was hanging about this far. <laughs> if I'd have been over another probably three feet <laughs> dumped off the cliff. Well, bulldozer, any kind of a track machine, when you put it in reverse, let out the clutch, it has a tendency to tip forward. And I sit there, my God. Got it in reverse and, and played with the clutch to inch the damn thing back without it mm -hmm. rocking. And I would say I come about that far from <laughs> diving off a 60 foot cliff. But I never opened it because of the rock and transportation and the conditions really wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> but that dozer was the biggest one that Caterpillar made. <laughs> Some place around here there's Yeah, this was a type of <clears throat> cable operating to operate the clutches on the back back side. All right. Uh, now, uh, to close this out then, uh, as you think back to the time that you spent in the service, um, what do you think you learned from it, or how did it affect you? <laughs> well, uh, one, one thing I learned, <laughs> was how to get along with people. That was the main thing. Because all through school, I had a lot of work to do at home. And I did not partake in much at school. As far as sports, I guess there was a couple times uh, class play, minor, mm -hmm. but very, very little activity in school. <clears throat> or in any other area with people my age until I went in the service. And that was one of the big items to get used to, the different kind of people and how to get along with them. And there was times that there was arguments. And <laughs> well, I guess it was still in the process. So when I volunteered for KP to get away from just sitting around. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the, one of the things that uh, attitude or change in lifestyle mm -hmm. <clears throat> and observing the the way officers, I will say this, the officers that I served under was all very good, except one. And he was newly commissioned, mm -hmm. all 
all spit and polish, always jumping on people for not saluting or having their shirt or their coat open yep. and whatnot. But attitude makes a big difference in in life. But I would say that was one of the big, big things that I learned in the military. But when people said jump, well, you jumped, even if you didn't like it. You learned to accept the responsibility. Which carried on through in my life in the tool dive business, getting along with, especially when you're a supervisor, and instructing people and teaching people to run machinery and how to do this mm -hmm. and that, the way you went about it. I took a lesson from some of the officers, the way they treated people mm -hmm. and how they, instead of giving an order, it was just kind of a calm conversation mm -hmm. type. That's, that's what I call learning from life. Right. <laughs> Make right. the best of it. Sure. All right. Well, the whole thing makes for, for a pretty good story, so I'd just like to close this out by thanking you for taking the time to share it. <laughs> well, it was interesting. I must say that...